Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the 571st meeting of the Economic Club of New York, and that number just grows and grows this year. This is our 113th year of the club. I'm John Williams. I'm chairman of the club and president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. As many of you know, the Economic Club of New York is the nation's leading nonpartisan forum for discussions on economic, social, and political issues. And our mission is as important today as ever as we continue to bring people together as a catalyst for conversation and innovation. And I'd like to take a moment to recognize those of our 312 members of the Centennial Society who are joining us today as their contributions continue to be the financial backbone of support for the club and help enable us to offer our wonderful and diverse programming both now and in the future. And a special welcome to members of the ECNY 2020 Class of Fellows. It's a select group of rising next-gen business thought leaders and make special note that applications for the 2021 class are now open. So I would ask you to visit our website for more details. We'd also like to welcome graduate students from the Baruch Zicklin School of Business and NYU Stern School of Business and the City University of New York Graduate Center. Now we have a very special guest today and we're welcoming back SEC Chair Jay Clayton. So Jay was nominated to chair of the US uh, Securities and Exchange Commission uh, in January of 2017 by President Trump and sworn in on May 4th of 2017. In addition to chairing the SEC, he's a member of the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, Financial Stability Oversight Council, and the Financial Stability Board. She also participates on the board of the International Organization of Securities Commissions. And key areas of focus for Jay at the commission have included furthering the interests of America's Main Street investors, updating and enhancing regulation and oversight of our equity and fixed income markets, taking into account advances in technology, and increase interconnectedness, making our capital markets, particularly our public capital markets, more accessible to business and invested investors, ensuring that the United States continues to be the world's leader in terms of transparency, effective disclosure, and effective uh, investor protection. Prior to joining the commission, Jay was a partner and co-head of corporate practice and management committee member at Sullivan and Cromwell. And from 20, 2009 to 2017, he was a lecturer in law and adjunct professor of the University of Pennsylvania Law School. And prior to that, he served as a law clerk for the Honorable uh, Marvin Katz of the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Pennsylvania. Member of the New York and Washington, D.C. bars, Jay earned his uh, deg uh, undergraduate degree in engineering from the University of Pennsylvania, a, a BA and MA in economics from the University of Cambridge, and his JD from the University of Pennsylvania Law School. It's a great uh, combination of engineering, economics, and law. And we have an exciting and different format for today's event. So following uh, Chairman Clayton's speech, yes. we'll take, he'll take questions from our panel of questioners. That's Gary Cohn, Harold Ford Jr., Glenn Hutchins, and Barbara Novick. Now we'll end promptly at 11.15, and any questions that members sent uh, to the club were shared in advance with our questioners. And as a reminder, the conversation is on the record, and we do have media on the line. Uh, so with all that introduction, I'm gonna turn it over to Jay for your opening remarks. Uh, thank you, John. Thank you, John. It's been a it's been a pleasure to serve on those intergovernmental bodies with you. Um, your expertise is uh, is clearly evident, and uh, and your elocution. So thank you. Um, well, it's wonderful to be back uh, with the Economic Club of New York. You're a sophisticated, experienced, outcome oriented, You've tough, and you, fair yeah. audience, interested in economic and wage growth and improving our society more generally. That's just the way it should be. As John noted. Today's program proceeds in two parts. First, remarks from me on our regulatory activities over the past three years. And at the end of that, I'll talk about speaking. It shows things going forward. Working. It shows um, coming and through. second, uh, Q&A session with uh, policy experts, Harold Ford, Barbara Novick, Gary Cohn, and Glenn Hutchins. As a focal point for today's review and outlook, I will use my first speech as chairman, which was before this very body in July, 2017. In that speech, I set forth the eight core principles that I hoped would guide my chairmanship. Before I report with specificity on implementing those principles in practice, I wanna go beyond principles. I wanna dig a bit deeper and explain how the women and men of the SEC achieved historic results over the past three and a half years. The short story is we designed and pursued a granular yet flexible three-year plan, and we were blessed with a talented driven, driven team of mutually supportive professionals. I'll go into more detail. A granular, flexible plan. This audience, again, an outcome-oriented group, if ever there was one, knows that a set of clear principles incorporated throughout the fabric of an organization 
is a hallmark of an effective enterprise, be it a private sector company or a governmental body. However, driving outcomes relies on, but requires more than a strong culture and collective commitment. It requires clearly articulated discrete objectives and a path for achieving them that has buy-in from all stakeholders. Early on, we set our objectives and we set a tangible and reasonable path. And we wanted to make sure we were being transparent about those objectives and our plans for achieving them, both internally and externally. As a rallying point, we used an often overlooked public transparency requirement, the Regulatory Flexibility Agenda Act. By federal law, agencies must disclose on a semi-annual basis regulations that are under development or review in the near term, that is within one year. In the post-Dodd-Frank era, the commission's near-term regflex agenda, as we call it, did not consistently reflect the regulations that were under active consideration. In fact, typically only about one third of the rules on the short-term agenda were timely advanced in the next year. We decided to change that and use the short-term regflex agenda to enhance transparency, promote cross-agency coordination and efficiency, and ensure both internal and public accountability. As a result of this reset, over the past few years, the short-term agenda has more closely tracked the Commission's actual rulemaking initiatives. People would ask me, Jay, what are you working on? I'd often say, there are no surprises. We're working on our RegFlex agenda, and we intend to complete it. The Commission advanced 88% of the 26 items on the 2018 agenda, and nearly 90% of the 39 items on the 2019 agenda. The Commission has had similar success with the 2020 short-term agenda, advancing to date 83% of the 43 items we had on the agenda, in addition to a number of unanticipated emergency rulemakings and orders as a result of our efforts to combat COVID-19. I believe this early focus on transparency and accountability was a driving factor in the effectiveness and historic productivity of the Commission's rulemaking. Across our divisions and offices, the priorities and timing expectations were clear allowing resources to be efficiently allocated and objectives achieved. To date, the Commission has issued 67 final rules across our policy offices and divisions during my tenure, with a few more to come. And while quantitative metrics are not sufficient to measure the success of a rulemaking agenda, I am confident that our investor-focused modernization efforts will have broad and positive effects for years to come. So let me turn from planning to execution. Some in Washington are fond of saying personnel is policy, and there certainly is truth in that expression. I'm very thankful for Jay Powell, Stephen Mnuchin, Randy Quarles, John Williams here today, Yelena McWilliams, Heath Tarbert, and many others who collectively are steering us through the COVID-19 shock. Today, I'm gonna add a twist to that quip. Not personnel is policy, but personnel is productivity. You cannot be productive without great personnel in both the public and private sector. In the public sector, in Washington, you do not have to look far to find a reason, and sometimes a dozen reasons, not to do something. Productivity speed bumps are around every corner. Even if the proposal on the table is a clear step forward for all concerned, opposition is ever present. One reason is interest groups, interest groups of all stripes. They often have narrow priorities including their own incentives to remain relevant. And solving broad, broad problems can reduce or even eliminate the relevance of both their articulated and unarticulated interests. Broad political interests also can produce speed bumps. We should accept these hurdles as our founders built them into our system for good reasons. But we must also work to overcome them, particularly the short-term variety. Another factor affecting execution is unforeseen events and shocks, and we've had a few of those. Several months after I arrived at the commission, I learned that our Edgar system had been hacked in 2016, and that non-public information taken from that breach may have in fact been used for illicit trading. Let me pause there. We had a system hacked, and the information taken may have been used for illicit trading. That was a total gut punch. But we, collectively, face this challenge head on. We investigated the breach, promptly disclosed it to the public and Congress, and requested our inspector general to oversee and investigate 
our response. Our enforcement division pursued the international hacking ring and brought charges against those responsible. These efforts set the tone for how to address future unexpected obstacles and challenges. I'll list a few other unexpected shocks that we had to navigate. First, a 35-day government shutdown. Second, a continued hiring freeze, which thankfully, and I thank Congress, we were eventually able to lift. Third, multiple international developments, including Brexit and the transition away from LIBOR. Fourth, a number of Supreme Court cases that significantly impacted our enforcement authority and practices. And last, as we all know and are dealing with today, the COVID-19 pandemic. So how do you overcome obstacles, both the expected and the unexpected? For me, it required two things. First, an organization that is expert in its subject area, in our case, knowing investors, disclosure principles, capital formation, and market function. And two, working proactively with a focus on outcomes. In common words, doing the right thing. And at the end of the day, that comes down to people. During my tenure, I was blessed with more than a dozen leaders who each knew more about their respective subject areas than just about anyone. And individually and collectively, we each worked with great, greater purpose than we ever had before. This approach was infectious and their respective staffs, including some personnel new to the commission and many with decades of service under their belts, put forth continuous effort, continuous buy-in, commensurate with the importance of our mission. Collectively, they achieved the metrics I mentioned and so much more. So now I'm gonna to touch on putting the principles I outlined some three and a half years ago into practice. There were eight principles I outlined uh, in 2017, and I'm not gonna walk through each of them. They will be available in more detail in my posted remarks. I'm gonna select a few of those principles and use examples to illustrate how our people followed those principles and our granular, flexible plan in delivering significant gains for our markets and our Main Street investors. So the first principle is the SEC's mission is our touchstone. This principle that our home base is to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly and efficient markets and facilitate capital formation to do all three, it would appear self-evident. But over the years, a premise has emerged that these three interrelated components of our mission have a necessary tension between them that puts them at odds with one another. Said another way, there is a misconception that to promote one part of the mission, you must detract from another. This is a false choice and inconsistent with dynamic, ever-changing markets and the SEC's great history. I am a firm believer that when we advance our mission, we should do just that, namely advance all aspects of our mission. Of course, we can simultaneously enhance investor protection and promote capital formation, while also ensuring more fair, orderly, and efficient markets. We've been doing that for over 80 years using technology as our partner. The examples are too many to detail in this speech, but I will point to one. Our recent work to historically revamp the exempt offering framework with a keen eye on small and medium-sized businesses and their investors. Here, harmonizing requirements across offering exemptions allows these businesses to more easily navigate our regulatory framework and ensure that they are complying with our rules including the important investor protections embedded in them. It's good for small businesses and good for investors. Our mission also serves as the greatest source of our authority. This is a very important point. Our authority, expertise, and ultimately our independence depend on us pursuing our mission. The further we stray from our mission, the weaker each of these becomes. As I spoke about last year, there are often times when parties with specific non-financial interests attempt to draw the SEC into engagements outside of our core mission or thrust new responsibilities onto us. To be sure, many of these interests are worthy of governmental time and attention. You know, we need to do something about them. However, our time and attention and our regulation, the SEC's time and attention, the SEC's regulation may not be appropriate. The commission may have neither the expertise nor the authority to act. Straying from our statutory mission and authority often brings risks, legal, political, and execution risks that may result in wasted resources or even the restriction of our authority going forward. Said another way, we should, re we should resist and be wary of calls to stretch our authority or quote, fill the space 
in areas that are not our primary responsibility, particularly in areas where others have primary responsibilities, expertise, and authority. I'll deviate from my prepared remarks, and since John is our host, and I'll say, I'm very happy to let the Fed do their job and for the SEC to do its job, because they do a heck of a job. And I'm pleased to say that we have resisted these calls in other areas while reasserting ourselves as the preeminent voice on the functioning of our markets for the benefit of investors and investing for the future. From the FSOC to IOSCO to the FSB to the PWG, the work of the SEC about markets is held in high regard and is a sought after commodity on issues that are clearly within our bailiwick. I see the culmination of this work as the recently released report on interconnectedness in our credit markets, in our credit markets led by our chief economist, S.P. Kothari. It is a fantastic example of interdivisional collaboration bringing to bear and distilling in a well-organized report the commission's significant market expertise insight. We are best able to advance our mission when we have good people. I can't say that enough. And our people are our most important asset. Their level of dedication, expertise, and commitment to our mission is unmatched in my professional lifetime. To continue to remain true to our mission and to provide the services investors would expect, it is incumbent upon us to keep pace with our ever-changing markets, including through targeting hiring of people with expertise in key areas. In this vein, refreshing our expertise necessarily means bringing in women and men with hands-on experience in markets, litigation, and other financial matters. In the past, this practice of bringing in outside expertise has led to criticism of a so-called revolving door. At the individual level, such blanket statements are not only devoid of any practical evidence of negative effects, but denigrate the impressive public service of those incredibly qualified, dedicated individuals. We should not make broad status-based judgments about the motivations of individuals. Let's take an example. Our Director of Trading and Markets, Brett Redfern. His electronic trading and broad market expertise was essential to our ability to move our markets, including our exchanges and other critical market infrastructure to a mandatory telework environment with minimal disruption at the onset of COVID-19. It's a map. It was amazing what we did, but we needed expertise to do it. More broadly, in order to regulate our increasingly complex markets, it is particularly valuable to have a wide array of current practical experience. I see the quality of individuals the SEC has been able to attract in the past few years as an overwhelming strength. It speaks to both the reputation of the SEC as a workplace, as well as to the character of the individuals wanting to serve the investing public. Another area in which we have made significant strides pursuing our tripartite mission is improving our commitment to diversity, inclusion, and opportunity. I firmly believe that enhancing each of those components within an organization strengthens both the fabric of the organization as well as its overall performance. Early this year, we released our first diversity and inclusion strategic plan. It was led by our Office of Minority and Women Inclusion under the direction of Pam Gibbs and was developed with input from around the agency. We have begun implementing a number of its near-term action items. And I wanna point out that two of today's questioners, Harold Ford and Glenn Hutchins, have been particularly helpful in our efforts over the past three years to promote diversity, inclusion, and opportunity. And I wanna thank you both on behalf of all the folks at the commission. I'm proud of the work that we have done in this area but there's still much that needs to be done. Said another way, the actions that we've taken are just the next step on a collective journey to improve diversity, inclusion, and opportunity. And I believe it's a journey that will continue productively for years to come here at the commission. So let me go to the second principle. Our analysis starts and ends with the interests of long-term Main Street investors. If you've heard me speak over the last three and a half years, you may wonder why this principle isn't first. I should have provided a caveat in my 2017 speech that while all of the principles are integral to our success, this principle is of particular import to me. So why is it so important? First to consider who we are talking about when we discuss the long-term Main Street investor. 
there are more than 52% of U.S. households that participate in the capital markets. They must have confidence that the capital markets are fundamentally fair and honest, and that we, the regulator, will take meaningful action to address fraud and abuse. Investors are willing to take risks, but they rightfully expect protection from bad actors. In 2017, I discussed how I was confident that the Commission staff shared this perspective. Let me say that that was an understatement. They embody that perspective each and every day. SEC staff understand the sacred trust that the architects of the securities laws extended to them. Discussions at the Commission on any topic effortlessly flow to the welfare of our Main Street investors. Our examination and enforcement programs often come to mind when people think of the SEC's connection with investors. I will say, early in 2017, reports of the untimely demise of both programs, many of which were written before the time I even walked in the door, were, to channel Mark Twain, greatly exaggerated. While my predecessor, Mary Jo White, and her great team set a high bar, the work of our Division of Enforcement, led by Stephanie Avakian and Steve Pekin, and our Office of Compliance, Inspections, and Examinations, what we call OSI, led by Pete Driscoll, have been exemplary, both on a qualitative and a quantitative basis, including as compared against any other time in commission history. While there are many ways our enforcement program serves investors, an area that we have placed a premium on in terms of resource allocation improvement is returning money to harmed investors. For many investors, the commission is their best chance and maybe their only chance to recoup funds from which they were defrauded, a fact that is often underappreciated. This focus since 2017, despite the significant headwinds from the Supreme Court's Kokesh decision, yielded approximately $3.5 billion returned to investors. On the regulatory side, this principle of focusing on the Main Street investors drove to the enactment and implementation of regulation best interest. The culmination of a decades long project to substantially enhance the standard of conduct for broker dealers when they make recommendations to retail customers. For the first time, broker dealers are now required to act in the best interest of the retail customers and not place their interests ahead of the customer's interests. As part of this initiative, the commission also adopted form CRS, which provides a short plain language form to Main Street investors with clear, concise information about their financial professional and also reaffirmed, but let me, let me pause here. This is so important that you have a straightforward statement about key aspects of the relationship that are digestible by a retail customer. And in this way, we've leveled the playing field and reaffirmed our commitment to individual investors. The totality of our package of rules and interpretations will enhance the quality and transparency of retail investors' relationships with broker dealers and investment advisors. There are reasons that this project had been talked about for years and years and decades and never accomplished. It was an incredibly difficult undertaking involving many entrenched interests. But from the start, commission, my colleagues on the commission and staff were clear eyed on the need to act and meet investor expectations. And the collaboration was first rate, particularly between the division of trading and markets led by the aforementioned Brett Redfern and our division of investment management under the direction of Dahlia Blass. Well, that's it for principle two. I'm gonna mention principles three and four, but leave the examples for my poster remarks. Principle three is the SEC's historic approach to regulation is sound. And principle four is regulatory actions drive change and change can have lasting effects. Let me go to principle five. As markets evolve, so must the SEC. At times, markets move faster than regulators. It's in their nature. And we usually are doing our best to keep up. At times, these evolutions can hit with both speed and significance. This occurred with the explosion of initial coin offerings or ICOs in 2017 and 2018. The commission moved swiftly to address these issues, including through timely enforcement actions in addition to the creation of our new cyber unit. Our policy, issue, our policy divisions issued guidance and other helpful frameworks to provide clarity to the market about the securities laws implications for new technologies. This approach worked and we have 
and we have seen the rampant speculation of those days give way to more productive engagement and dialogue around the technology's beneficial traits. Another area where the SEC needed to evolve as the market had far overtaken our regulatory framework was the proxy process. The commission worked to narrow the gap between our regulations and market practices, particularly those relating to proxy voting advice. Over the last several decades, we've seen a seismic shift in how small and mid-sized investors invest, from investing directly through individual holdings to investing indirectly through institutional holdings, particularly through mutual funds, ETFs, and other fund structures. These funds, which hold retail investments valued in the tens of trillions of dollars, are managed by market professionals, investment advisors who have a fiduciary duty to make investment and voting decisions in the best interests of the fund. Yet when these funds are invested in hundreds or even thousands of different companies, determining whether and how to cast each vote can be costly. This fact and fundamental economic factors such as economies of scale and network effects led to the rise of proxy voting advice businesses and market concentration. During this evolution, these firms benefited from longstanding, significant, and clearly dated exemptions to our proxy solicitation rules. In the past decade, these firms have come to have de facto dispositive or substantial influence over many matters brought to votes of shareholders. This year, the SEC updated our solicitation exemptions in a principles-based manner that requires disclosure of conflicts of interests and will result in investors receiving an improved mix of information before they vote. These amendments will generate a more transparent proxy voting system where the information will provided will both better inform voting decisions and facilitate compliance by market professionals with their fiduciary obligations to the funds they manage. We also reminded investment advisors of these voting obligations and that they are not dismissed when they use third party providers, including proxy voting advice businesses. Most important, the rules and guidance will better align the interests of ordinary investors with the obligations of those who vote and invest on their behalf, a fundamental purpose of market regulation. I'm also going to mention principles six and seven but to leave the examples for my posted remarks. Principle six is effective rulemaking does not end with rule adoption. And principle seven is costs of a new rule now often include the costs of demonstrating compliance. I, I urge those students in the audience to take a look at this one. Um, it's often not taught uh, in law and business school, but demonstrating compliance is something you need to think about. Let me go to the final principle, principle eight. That is that coordination is key. The scope of the SEC's professional relationships is impressive. More than 15 federal regulatory bodies, over 50 state and territory securities regulators, the Department of Justice, state's attorneys general, SROs, and non-SRO standard setting entities. We interact with them all on a regular basis. This system of entities with distinct, yet sometimes overlapping jurisdictions has been called fragmented by many but regardless of critiques of its structure, it is the system we have to work within. With that many domestic counterparts, not to mention our international counterparts, effective coordination and collaboration is more than a professional courtesy. Domestically, we have engaged directly with the administrative and regulatory agencies, as well as through various interagency groups. For example, within the FSOC, the agencies work together to address emerging issues and rationalize our focus on activities-based systemic risks. The Department of the Tr Treasury resurrected the PWG, which led to valuable movement on issues from cybersecurity to investor protections in emerging markets. Each of these engagements, which occurs throughout our tenures, built strong relationships among the principals and staff at the various agencies. It allowed us to work together seamlessly on complex, on complex matters as they arose. Importantly, this constant dialogue established muscle memory we relied on extensively when we needed it most, including during the market shocks of March and April resulting from COVID-19. I do not need to rehash that period, but the professional and personal relationships established over the prior three years led to a more decisive, more unified, 
and I believe ultimately more impactful response to those economic effects. So now I'm gonna turn briefly to discuss a few areas that I think need further commission attention. I have additional items in my poster remarks. First, I hope the commission will continue to work around modernizing our proxy system and in particular exploring ways to modernize our rules on shareholder communications so that companies can engage with their shareholders more directly and efficiently. For example, the obo nobo, that's objecting beneficial owner slash non-objecting beneficial owner rules are overdue for re-examination. It can be difficult and costly for companies to identify and communicate with their shareholders on important corporate governance issues. This has arisen in other contexts as well, including our recent proposal to update Form 13F, where public companies have made it clear that issuers and other market participants are using Form 13F data in an attempt to address, in part, the shortcomings of our proxy rules. We should update our proxy plumbing system to support and ensure that there are efficient communication channels between corporations and their shareholders. Another area of continued commission attention is good corporate hygiene. The importance of good corporate hygiene cannot be overstated, nor can the importance of related controls designed to prevent not only insider trading, but also the appearance of impropriety or misalignment of interests. Particularly in times of heightened market volatility and uncertainty, the potential for executives to possess material non-public information increases, as we have witnessed during this time of COVID-19 induced economic and market stress. While I believe many of our public companies as a general manager have discharged their responsibilities in the related areas of public disclosure and corporate controls very well during this difficult time, there are some specific measures that would improve compliance, market integrity, and investor confidence, including through a demonstrated commitment to good corporate hygiene. I will specifically mention Rule 10b-51 plans, which when designed and administrated appropriately can facilitate long-term interest alignment and other principles of good corporate governance. There are practices, have, however, there are practices, however, that while they may be consistent with law and regulation, raise questions of interest alignment and fairness, including in particular issues that arise when plans are implemented, amended, or terminated, and trading occurs or does not occur around those events. I believe the company should strongly consider requiring all 10B51 plans for senior executives and board members to include mandatory seasoning or waiting periods after adoption, amendment, or termination before trading under any plan or replacement plan can begin or recommence. Let me talk a little bit about climate-related disclosures. I'm fond of saying that ESG, and we often talk about climate in the context of an ESG discussion, is not a monolithic concept, and it should not be treated as such. In fact, Ken Arrow won a Nobel Prize for disputing such a notion in the context of preference ordering. For those of you who were with us last year, uh, it took me a long time to mention my favorite economist, but you know everybody has theirs. Uh, so E, S, and G. I believe each of E, S, and G should be viewed within its own context, because for one reason, the approach to investment analysis appears to vary widely from investor to investor, person to person around these concepts, and incorporating them into one measure just doesn't make sense. Timeframes, preferences, and the like, they are all different. I believe that E, S, and G should be focused on separately. I will briefly focus on E disclosures where I believe there is the most interest at this time. And that's at least in part because G disclosures under our rules are the gold standard. Let me, let me say that again. We talk about E, S, and G, but from the OM, uh, from reports from Congress and the like, I see virtually no problem with GE disclosure. We have a lot of it, it's robust, people are held responsible for it. If there are particular items, you know, send them in. But our focus going forward should be more on the S and the E. So turning to the E, as a threshold matter, I note that the extent material, issuers are required to disclose the current and future effects of climate-related issues on their operations and performance. 
it's important that this disclosure be decision useful, uh, in our terms, material. In other words, that it provide investors with the ability to incorporate the information regarding the current and future performance of the issuer into their investment decision process. It often has been noted this, this process can be more efficient if disclosure is standardized or uniform. However, standardization can be difficult across industries, and in particular with respect to forward-looking information. It can be extremely vexing as it requires uniform assumptions about the future across industries. Personally, I am of the view that any standardization should be approached, at least initially, on a sector-by-sector -sector basis, starting with the sectors that are already using metrics to track and assess climate-related risks. I expect to have more to say on this soon, so please stay tuned. Well, that's the end of my prepared remarks. It's my hope that I've covered a lot of ground in an open matter that encourages continued engagement. That has been our stated approach from the start, and I hope that we have lived up to it. In that vein, I await the engagement from our distinguished questioners. Back to you, John. Thank you, Jay, uh, for your very thoughtful remarks and your leadership on all of these important issues. You did remind me, though, and you listened to your remarks, that I did have the unique um, privilege of being taught the history of economic thought by Ken Arrow when I was a grad student. It's a memory that I <laughs> still hold uh, uh, dear. The, um, I especially want to echo your, your comments, just very briefly, uh, about the dedication, the expertise, the professionalism of the SEC staff. Obviously, the same applies at the Federal Reserve. Um, you look at this year, this has been a time when our, all of our uh, colleagues have stepped up uh, and done amazing things uh, uh, in, this, in the service of our country and just wanted to echo those um, remarks that you made. So now it's my job to introduce our, our panel of four questionnaires. Uh, questioners. Uh, we're going to start with Gary Cohn. Uh, he's, Gary served as assistant uh, to the President for Economic Policy and Director of the National Economic Council from January 2017 till April 2018. As President Trump's chief economic advisor, Mr. Cohn managed the administration's economic policy ag agenda and led its tax and regulatory reform efforts. Then we have Harold Ford Jr. He's currently the executive vice president and vice uh, chairman of PNC's corporate and institutional banking group. Uh, he served in Congress for 10 years from 1997 to 2007, representing Tennessee's ninth congressional district. And was a member of the House Financial Services, Budget and Education Committees as well as the Blue Dog and Congressional Black Caucuses. Then we have Glenn Hutchins, who's chairman of the North, I of North Island and a co-founder of Silver Lake. He's the director of AT&T and Virtu Financial, co-chairman of the Brookings Institution and Care on the executive committees of the Boston Celtics um, and the Obama Foundation, and a board member of the New York Presbyterian Hospital and the Center for American Progress, and most importantly, at least to me, on the board of directors of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. <laughs> Finally, we have Barbara Novick, who is vice chair, co-founder, and member of BlackRock's Global Executive Committee, uh, Enterprise Risk Committee, and Geopolitical Risk Committees. Uh, from the inception of the firm in 1988 through 2008, Ms. Novak headed the Global Client Group and oversaw global business development, marketing, and client service across equity, fixed income, liquidity, alternative investment, and real estate products for institutional and individual investors in, and their intermediaries worldwide. So I'm looking forward to hearing this discussion. And Gary, uh, you can go ahead with the first question. John, thank you. And Jay, let, let me first start out and um, thank you and thank your team for the personal sacrifice you made for serving our country. We're a better place for the sacrifices that you made. And I just want to start for thanking you and amazing team you surrounded yourself with. Um, you mentioned early in your speech, which I found interesting, your conversations with Quarles, Mnuchin, Powell, McWilliams, Williams, all of the above. Um, how often did you talk to each other? And when you think of your tenure at the SEC, almost 25% of it was dealing with COVID, COVID-related issues. How important was that? Because you guys clearly did a very good job of sort of landing this as, as well as you possibly could have. Well, um, first of all, they're all terrific people. Uh, and all terrific and experienced professionals. And what I would say, Gary, is that the formal mechanisms of the FSOC and the PWG 
um, as you know, because you participated in, in, in some of these, uh, were the first connections. Uh, but then those connections developed formally and informally on a bilateral basis. And, and what I want to really say is they were incredibly efficient interactions. It's like, what's our objective? What information can you bring to bear? How can we best make decisions? And so uh, when, when COVID hit and the Fed needed information about the functioning of our markets, the functioning of money markets and the like, it was, here's the information, here's our perspective, you know, let's make the best decision we can. Uh, and it was reciprocal uh, when we were thinking about, you know, can we actually move to an electronic trading environment? You know, no one on the floor, everybody remote. Will the, will the pipes and the, will the pipes still uh, support that? You know, communicating uh, among the various regulators was uh, was fantastic. That, you know, people matter, and they're 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 just very high quality people who are who are mission oriented. Great, thanks. Thanks. Good good late morning, good late. Uh, Chairman. I joined Gary in thanking you for your service, and I hope that this is not your last run. Uh, and serving the public. I hope you have another opportunity to, to do that. Uh, you started the speech off uh, also uh, uh, where you really focus all your attention, I believe, and most importantly as chair, focusing on Main Street investors. This morning you talked a great deal on CNBC about how regulation or thoughts around new regulations are triggered. We have a number of students on the call. Uh, I would imagine with the rise and in interest and popularity around cryptocurrency, there may be some curiosity in you elaborating on that point. And two, you talked a little bit about income inequality this morning. And I know in your speech today, you spoke of how the, the SEC, the agency should stay in its lane. But as you think about those breaches and those in inequities and inequalities, you personally are committed to that. Give us a little more color on how you've approached that as a chair and how you would hope your successor uh, approaches it. Well, I love that question. Um, because I think something that, that COVID has brought into stark relief, but some of us knew, and, and we can continue to have a discussion with this, if you're not connected in this economy financially, you're being left behind. If you don't have a bank account, we can't get you paycheck protection. If you don't have an understanding of basics of investing, you're not gonna have as good a retirement. You know, Getting costs down, diversifying your portfolio, starting early, those are things that people should get, as I thought of saying, you should get those with your mother's milk. You should get them in elementary school. You know, I know Harold, years ago you had a you had an idea which was, hey, let's just let's just give every kid a bank account or an investment. And let's let's get them connected to our economy early on um, with financial literacy. And that is in our lane. Um, it, it's very much in our lane to out to have outreach to people, get them connected. We're much more responsible today than at any time in the last 50, 60 years for our own retirements. We need to help people do that. So that's that's of extreme importance to me. I mean, I, we could talk a little bit more about crypto, but I just let me pause there because I don't think that the importance of being connected, being connected early, can be overstated. Thank you. Hi. Um, first of all, thank you for your service and for your leadership at the SEC. Um, my question is, you talk about the RegFlex agenda and you've used it um, in a very transparent way. What things would you have on the RegFlex agenda in 2021 if you were chair? And related to that, what is your advice to your successor? Well, let, let me say this. Mar Mary Jo did a terrific job of not not binding me when I came into this job. I had a lot of a lot of freedom, a lot of a lot of flexibility. So. Uh, I want to I want to return the favor to whoever uh, uh, is next. Um, I did mention that I think the proxy process is is long overdue um, for continued uh, what I would say is continued modernization with all of our technology. You ought to be able to find your shareholders. Now I know sometimes shareholders don't want to be known by their company. That's fine, but if you want to get a message to them, there's got to be ways to do that. Um, and you know, uh, look, I, I would say continued. Um, harmonization uh, internally, domestically, and with our foreign counterparts. Uh, when you have asymmetric treatment, it creates problems. Now, one may be better than the other, and we need to continue to assess, but those those are two places that I would look in setting an agenda going forward. So, Jay, um, before I um, 
uh, ask my question here. I want to just compliment uh, John Williams on his leadership for the Economic Club of New York. I think it's an important role that the, uh, chair, the, the president of the Federal Reserve Bank in New York undertake. Uh, so adds to his responsibilities, but John, thank you for doing this. Um, Jay, uh, one of the, I think you gave yourself short shrift in your remarks for the extent to which you fostered innovation in the financial markets while you've been uh, chairman uh, while protecting investors. Uh, and um, as Harold suggested, and let's get the crypto, uh, the uh, one of the, the maybe at the not the cutting edge, but the bleeding edge of fintech innovation during your time period at the SEC has been cryptocurrencies. Um, uncharted territory, which you've navigated with both those goals, investor protection, but fostering innovation in mind. Tell us a little bit about that journey as you've been uh, chairman of the SEC and give us some sense of where you think it goes from here. Oh, um well, thank you. Uh, a lot of that goes to the, the 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 women and men on our staff who uh, who hit this head on. But uh, I, I look when when we arrived three years ago, uh, the promise of this technology was becoming readily apparent. Unfortunately, um, the promise got channeled into an area where we have long-standing um, regulations that have worked really well. And that is that you can't make a widespread public offering of securities without going through the SEC registration process. And uh, ICOs and the like uh, essentially flaunted that. And look, I don't blame people for being motivated to try and take a new technology and raise money using it. But uh, you know, I was I was not going to be the I was not going to be the chair that threw the 33 Act out after 80 you know 85 years of success. So <laughs> so there you have it. But that said incredibly powerful technology for the financial sector. I mean, it's technology that greatly reduces the costs of verification. It's technology that greatly reduces the costs of information transmission. Um, and, and it's technology that, that can drive some of the inefficiencies out of our system. So that's where we are today. You know, comply with the securities laws, but, you know, push the technology forward. And the area that, um, is particular uh, of particular interest to me and many of those regulators that that Gary mentioned is the payment system. We all recognize that our payment system is inefficient. Uh, domestically, it's inefficient. Internationally, it's extremely inefficient. So if we don't work and use technology to address those inefficiencies, the market is going to do it for us. And I think we'll we'll like the outcome much better if we as regulators proactively enter that payment space, um, ensuring that all the time, um, all the time proven safeguards around AML, bank secrecy, anti-terrorism and the like are there. Um, so I, I, see, I see significant promise going forward, Glenn. So Chairman, last time we were together, we spent an enormous amount of time talking about an amazing report that the SEC put out on short-term funding and the interconnectedness of short-term funding and how it, I would say, bled or fed through almost every market. Mm -hmm. um, you guys at the SEC did a unbelievably intricate study on short-term funding and its effect on almost all markets and how it, it, it works. Why did you decide at the SEC to take on this huge project? It doesn't seem like a natural place for the SEC. Um, Gary, what, that, it's, it's, thank you for the question. Thank you for the compliment. Um, we tend to look at our markets, uh, whether it's on TV or as analysts, in a very specialized way. We look at equities. In fact, some people look at large cap equities, small cap equities. We look at fixed income. Um, we look very narrowly when we analyze our markets. But what, what COVID showed was all of those markets, the, the transactions in those, all of those markets rely on short-term funding. Said another way, if your short-term funding markets aren't functioning, the other markets can't function. And so that's, those are the securities markets. Those short-term funding markets also facilitate consumer credit facilitation, housing credit, other credit. Everything comes back to those key short-term funding markets. And the center of those short-term funding markets is the treasury market. So when we were seeing the dash for cash um, and the treasury market seizing up, you know, John Williams and his colleagues at the Fed, yeah, they did a fantastic job. 
because they recognize, look, this is this is the centerpiece of our credit-based economy. Let's make sure that there's liquidity. Let's make sure that it's functioning. Um, and you know, I that that is that is one of three or four steps that was absolutely essential to prevent um, long-term effects from a very short-term financial problem. Um, so we thought it was important to document that while it was fresh in people's minds and try to do so in a rigorous way. And uh, it's funny, we got, I, 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 somebody sent me a note the other day that said, why didn't you make any policy recommendations? I said, because we didn't want people to think we did this in order to drive a policy agenda. We just, we just want people to know how it's functioning so that they can then think about policy, um, policy recommendations. I'd like to follow up on Gary's question. Um, first of all, we couldn't be more thankful for the swift and bold action of all the regulators and the coordination between your team and the Fed and the New York Fed and, and others. It really was uh, quite spectacular in, back in March. Um, but my question is, when you look around at capital markets around the world, the U.S. really is a shining example of good capital markets and a um, differentiator, if you will, of bank finance versus market finance and the mix. So given that, what is the best way for the U.S. regulators to interact with the global standard setters and raise the bar? I mean, I, I, I guess what we're all hoping is we don't see a, a least common denominator outcome, but actually a highest common, common denominator and maximizing for everyone. What's the best way to get that outcome? Uh, I do th I do think it is with, with rigorous analysis, Barbara. Um, explaining to people, as uh, I think which was embedded in your comment, that having a, having a market-based credit system that complements your bank credit system allows an economy to be more nimble. Um, you can more more quickly allocate capital um, to places where it's in need, um, to places where there's growth. And I, I can tell you that the nimble nature of our credit markets, I believe has helped, I have a couple of things on this, but I believe it has helped um, us deal with the pandemic, the economic shame of the pandemic, and it will help us come out more quickly than comparable um, systems of comparable maturity in terms of societal maturity. Um, just to delve into that a little more, uh, the signaling that goes on in our marketplace, mostly from our public companies, where is employment needed? Where is employment not needed? All, all, all of that communication, I think, and, and Glenn and I have talked about this, greatly facilitates reallocation of resources. Um, and the more signaling you have, the more efficiencies you have. Our, our, our disclosure-based system, where you have to disclose what you're doing today, greatly helps that. Let me say it another way, Barbara. Prescribed disclosure about how to run a company doesn't work when the eggs get scrambled. You have to say how we're dealing with the world today, not how we built some framework for dealing with the world of yesterday. Jay, uh, Chairman, really quickly, just on, on the issue of uh, of cybersecurity, you touched on it in the speech and disclosures you expect from, from large companies. Um, the progress you made there and the progress you'd like to see going forward. Well, I, I, I would really like companies to be comfortable disclosing any significant cyber incident. It's not, it's not, a, it's, it's not a negative mark on a company. It's, it's a reality of, of today's you know, cyber infrastructure that there are going to be attacks. There, there are going to be successful attacks. Um, the more information that we have collectively about that, um, the better we can build our, uh, uh, our cybersecurity and more importantly, our cyber resiliency when something does happen. Um, I think companies are doing a better job than say, you know, four or five years ago, would like to see continued disclosure and, you know, better coordination um, in response. But, you know, it should be front of mind for all of us. Um, it's something that, you know, I'm still worried about all the time. Uh, uh, you know, large denial of service attacks around our critical market infrastructure is just something we need to continue to focus on. So, uh, Jay, pivoting off those two questions um, and pointing toward the future, um, let's talk about the SEC's role in 
uh, disclosure around climate change. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people have um, analogized the pandemic to climate change, a scientific problem that's been politicized, a problem that we see looming in front of us that we're making it, but since it's long term, we're making insufficient steps to deal with today, uh, et cetera, et cetera. How do you think about uh, about the SEC's role in somewhere between prescribing compelling disclosure from companies about the long-term effects of climate change on their businesses so that investors are aware? So, Glenn, I think we have um, an engagement facilitation role to play here. And look, good companies um, that are ha are being affected by changes in climate, let's, let's just pick some property and casualty insurers. They're looking at this issue. They're looking at what it means for their business. They're measuring it. Let's, let's get what they're doing on the table with investors so investors can see it in that industry and understand, I believe, look, I'm speaking for myself here, and understand that from sector to sector, the way people look at climate change now, the climate change risk they face, the current effects of it, is different because it affects sectors differently. Said another way, I'm, I'm very wary of people looking for a single metric as, an, as providing an ability to assess whether a company should be allocated capital or not, what its risks are and what they're not. These are, these are very company specific and um, what I would say certainly sector specific um, issues. And I, you know, roll, roll up our sleeves, dig in, look at them. Um, that's where we are today. Now, it also has a problem because uh, it's forward looking. We're really good at backward looking disclosure. How much money did you make last year? How many widgets did you did you did you put out? Uh, for years, backlog, which is kind of a, an, an assessment of you know how how much is a company going to produce in the years to come? Disclosure around backlog, looking out just a couple of years, we all know that it's uncertain. That the that the prediction. Yeah, and the reality are likely to be different, and as we say in the parlance, sometimes materially different. That's a reality with climate change disclosure. Doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but we need to recognize that it's forward-looking. You know, again, speaking for myself, I believe that it's the kind of forward-looking information that should benefit from a safe harbor. Um, you know, because it is uncertain. Um, it's also quite difficult because there's not a common touchstone. Now, common touchstones are developing. If it's, if it's true that international policymakers, and the choice of this policy is not for the SEC, but if the choice of policy is carbon neutrality or zero carbon 2050, then you have something to disclose against going forward. And you have a way to, a way to assess what path your business has to take um, in order to perform best for its stakeholders. So Glenn, I've talked a lot, but hopefully that demonstrates that I've, I've thought more than superficially about this issue. Oh, very interesting, thank you. So, Chairman, I'm going to ask you the uh, proverbial Washington question, since this is the uh, New York Economic Club. Um, and I'll, I'll take you off the hook on this one. I'll, I'll tell you, let's assume Biden is the next president. So I'll make it easy for you. If I tell you to assume Biden's the next president, you, from your you point of view. Gary, you would have been a good law professor. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I'm, going to, I'm taking you out of your legal background here. So I'm going to put you in the economics world. Let's assume Biden's the next, 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 next president of the United States. From an economic policy platform, you've been around Washington, you, you've spread your wings very wide, and you're very in touch with all the issues. Where do you see the big challenges and opportunities for the Biden administration going forward, and, and how should he attack the, the, these, these, these opportunities? Um, look, I, I, I'm gonna go back to my speech, uh, and I'm also, uh, I'm also looking at the screen here. Um, uh, personnel is policy, personnel is productivity, um, the opportunities and on the financial side, well, I'm, I'm, I'm actually looking at the screen here. I, I don't know Barbara's political affiliation, but I, I, I see three diehard Democrats in, uh, in Harold, Glenn and Gary. So, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, my, my advice is, is, is get, uh, in, engaged, um, experienced, uh, Professionals who care who care about the Main Street investor, who care about um, wage growth, um, and have thought thought for some time how to drive those things. I think that look, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm president company excluded, 
I think that's uh, a characteristic John Williams and the rest of my federal financial regulators share. Pick people like that. So I'm going to try and get something upbeat um, and see if we <laughs> that can was, find that, was, that wasn't upbeat? <laughs> right. So I want to try to find some I tried, some to, draft, positive, I tried to draft Glenn into the government. <laughs> some, some, some positives from, from COVID. And um, I guess I know you, you obviously made a lot of short-term um, exemptions and changes. And you've been gathering data on what things maybe should be done permanently, whether it's e-delivery or virtual board meetings. But what what lessons do you get from COVID that you say on the look forward on positive lessons, things that maybe should be continued um, in, in not just 2021, but really a long term, um, whether it's the use of video or, or any any aspects that come out on the positive side. No, I, Barbara, and 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 you know there there are some. It goes back to what I was talking to Harold about when we shifted to electronic. We saw how much more efficient that was. We we had held on to a lot of paper based, mail based regulations. You know, we we should not let the pace of mail and the constraints of paper guide our regulations. Yeah. Investors have a much better experience with the electronic delivery of information. It can be layered. It can be um, they, they can manipulate it, analyze it, do all those kinds of things. I think we have to recognize that. I, I would expect that virtually all of the short-term electronic communication relief that we put into place will become permanent with an assessment of whether any additional investor protection and, and market integrity uh, measures are necessary. But th this clearly demonstrated that. And, and going back to what Harold said, it demonstrates how important it is for everybody to be connected in that way, because if you're not, you're behind. Uh, Chairman, I know we, we're running short on time. I, I just want to say thank you again for, for your leadership around the diversity and inclusion efforts. I, I, I take personal pride with it because you were fortunate, you were kind enough to involve me in trying to be helpful, but you deserve tremendous credit there. And I know you don't like to speculate or perhaps put anything on successors, but I do hope your successor uh, pursues it with the same rigor uh, and the same focus that, uh, that you did. So thanks for that and congratulations. Thank you, Emma. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Jay, let's, um, as we, uh, we're getting close to the end. I think we've got another 10 minutes, if I'm not wrong. Wait, 10 minutes? I'm sorry, I thought we were sp stopping at 11. I, I apologize. I'm not sure. So maybe someone could tell us. But I'm gonna ask this, I'll ask this question. Uh, I thought it was 11.15, but we'll see. Um, uh, the system, let's talk about the system. Uh, the um, chairman of the SEC is notably on the uh, Financial Stability Oversight Council, FSOC came out of Dodd-Frank. You've been actively involved in that. You've been notable, I think, as an SEC chairman in coordinating. You mentioned all the names of people you work with, but that's indicative of all the people you coordinated with uh, is your role in government. You looked outside the SEC and took responsibility for the system. We've talked about some major systemic issues, short-term funding markets, um, cyber climate change. As you think, as you look across the system now, what would you um, think of or, or what would you commend to all of us who are involved either in government or in private markets to be mindful of as we think about risk to the system over the course of the coming years? Um, I, I do look, I, it's always the things you don't know, but let, let me talk about the things I, I, I do know, and that is those short term funding markets, making sure that not only are they resilient and that we take steps to make sure they're resilient, but that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater because they are so important. I mean, they, they, they provide a, a, a real function. So you, you've got to go at whatever reforms we do through FSOC or the PWG or the FSB with both of those elements in mind, um, how important they are, how we need to protect them, but also how they need to function in order to, uh, in order to provide credit. Um, and uh, look, I think uh, long-term ec economic um, impact, uh, let me just say, let me say it this way, Glenn, uh, maybe even shorter term. The, the CARES Act, the actions of the Fed, all in combination um, uh, to, to keep the consumer, which uh, Gary always talks about this, as, as part of our economy um, going, um, to keep housing prices. I mean, consumers going, consumer has money in the pocket, housing prices stay stable. Everything comes back. 
that that stability is really important and measures that are tailored to maintain that stability as we get through the pandemic um, are extremely important and by the way i would argue that um, economic inequality and uh, lack of financial inclusion which harold is focused on is another major risk to the system that needs to be i that was very just, and i'm john i know you agree with that let me not uh, let me not let that pass without saying i completely agree i really want i really want all Americans to be connected to our financial system. By the way, team, the organizers sent us a chat. We're going to, we're going for until 11:13, and then they're going to wrap up for two minutes after that. So we got another seven minutes. Okay. In one of your earliest speeches that I heard as chair, you focused on the capital markets and specifically on the equity markets, and whether or not Main Street investors were participating um, the way they used to, and you know, did they have the same opportunity set versus private equity markets? During your tenure, we've also seen direct listings, SPACs, uh, listings with no shareholder or voting rights. We, we've seen quite a few innovations. Um, if you could reflect back, starting where you were in that early speech and today, what's gone better and what's gone worse? Um, I do think that Let's, let's let's talk about this in terms of companies that are a billion dollars or more in size, because below that it's idiosyncratic, and many of them the public markets are not appropriate for. But at a at, at that size and above, I think that the the private public choice we have facilitated the public choice being an easier choice to execute on, without diminishing investor protection. Now people are choosing different avenues and direct listings and SPACs and the like. That's those are. I believe those are competitive innovations on how to distribute stock. We have to watch them closely to make sure that people are getting the same protections that they get with a traditional IPO. But I do believe that that private public choice, um, we've gotten rid of some of the unnecessary frictions. That said, um, and, and why do we love the public markets so much? Because in the public markets, the retail investor gets the same deal as the most sophisticated institutional investor. Same price, same access, same everything. In the private markets, that's much harder because of all the, the frictions and, and whatnot in the private markets. I would love to see us get products that put the individual investor on par with the very sophisticated private equity and venture investors in terms of returns, fees, et cetera. We're working on it through fund structures. It's a tough nut to crack, but I think it's something worth pursuing. Chairman, what was what was the um, the hardest uh, thing in dealing with? You talked about your board of directors, Congress. I mean, not to be critical of the, the the institution. There's enough of that, and I do resemble your comment about being a Democrat. Uh, <laughs> but I'm curious as you as you as you think about um, the kind of structural challenges and friction. I mean, if you seem to get along, I give the back. You seem to have gotten along very well with everyone. People had positive experiences with you. But if there was one structural thing you could change, uh, what might that be? Um, well, this is an arcane uh, law. It's called the Government in the Sunshine Act. So we have five um, commissioners. Uh, that law has been interpreted such that we're not allowed to get together as a group um, outside of a public meeting. Now, I believe in public knowing exactly what we're doing. That's why I publish our uh, RegFlex agenda. I mean, I Barbara follows what we do on a, on a regular basis. There were no surprises, right? I mean, it's all laid out. This is what we're doing. Uh, um, to the extent that we can facilitate a period where the five of us, the four of us, the three of us, whatever the composition of the commission is at the time, to talk about broad policy considerations and how we think about them, and to be able to do that in a candid way, I think that would greatly enhance um, productivity and the quality of the product. Because when you have to guess what people are thinking, or you only get insight through written words or, or through a staff person who's doing their best to faithfully represent your views, you can't see the emotion, you can't see the relative. I would do something about that. And, and again, not in any way that diminishes transparency to the public, but we, we ought to be able to, to get together as a decision-making body. So I guess I'll jump in with one last question, which is related to advice for the future. 
you've somehow managed to reach out to all these other agencies um, and even more than the ones that you listed, the Department of Labor, the CFTC. You know, it's really been a, a remarkable group um, in the last several years. How do we institutionalize that? Because that's not the way Washington is usually working. It's usually much more siloed and has a reputation for turf and, and whatnot. How do you institutionalize the teamwork approach? Um, well, uh, let me say this. I, I believe in governance structures and good governance structures, but we always have to remember that governance structures aren't an end in themselves. They're a means to an end. And what, what, what are they designed to do with, with, let's take, for example, FSOC or the PWG? The, the mindset ought to be not what can those agencies do for me, but what can I do for them? What, what expertise do we have here at the SEC that's going to help you know, Harvard at the CFTC do that job? Or you know, John Williams at, at, the, at the Fed um, uh, do his job? If you, if you take that mindset into it, and I'm not saying I'm the, like, fantastic about that or whatever, but it, you get the reciprocal from many people. And if you could develop a dynamic where people look at, you know, how, how can I assist them with their job? They're looking to assist you um, with your job. Just a, and sometimes it's just a five-minute phone call for the heads up. I mean, Gary, you 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 tried to coordinate. You, you your your job was to herd the cats a bit. Well, it was. Look, I, I remember the first meeting and putting all you guys together in, around one dinner table. Oh. So, so, so uh, Jay, let me let me let me follow up on that one. Uh, let me follow up on Barbara's question. You know, now after having sat in the seat for four years. And, de and having dealt with our European regulatory communities, our Asian regulatory communities, where they're more streamlined and have less agencies in, than we do in the, in the United States, should we think about modernizing our U.S. regulatory systems on the, on the security side and try and put it into a more streamlined regulatory system? So uh, it's funny. Um... You say four years, and four years is a long time to be in one of these jobs, um, but it's it's too short a time to try and order your affairs to cause that to happen. You just you just accept the way it is, um, and I think I actually think if you do have that communication, the fact that you have these pockets of expertise, as long as you have that proactive communication, it can be at least as effective, if not more effective. Um, on the other hand, if you don't have it, uh, you have the silo problem, um, and that's, uh, you know, look, you should, let's put it this way. We should always be checking to make sure that we're we're a network, not a bunch of silos. So, Jay, I'm going to turn it over to our president now, Barbara Van Allen, but in, in passing, in closing, I just want to say I hope you get those five strokes off your handicap over the next six months. <laughs> I'm glad you said you five strokes. I'm glad you said five strokes, not five pounds. <laughs> You deserve it. Thanks, pal. Well done. Bravo. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Jay. Thank you Jay. all very much. Yeah, many thanks, uh, Jay, for a terrific speech. And thanks to our questioners, Gary, Harold, Glenn, and Barbara. Uh, we really appreciate it today. Just great questions. I'm pleased to report that we have many great speakers lined up. As always, we encourage you to invite guests to our events. Uh, this coming Monday, we're going to host Janelle Doris, who's commissioner of the New York City Department of Small Business. She's going to share insights on specific initiatives underway to help Black-owned small businesses that are facing profound challenges uh, in New York City during the current COVID crisis and other efforts to advance racial equity. I hope you all will join us. Uh, the club also has programming that's going to go well into December. We have LL Cool J, uh, CEO of Rock the Bells, December 1st. Melody Hobson, co-CEO and president of Ariel Investments, December 2nd. And we actually have more to come, uh, some exciting ones, uh, for well into December. So please continue to monitor our website. We'll continue to communicate by email. Thank you again for joining us. And, and Jay and our questioners again, many thanks.